catch me hollering at the moon. Oh, there you are. There I am. And the connection seems to be so much better today. Well, once I met you, I decided I ought to put on a jacket. <laughs> well, then maybe it was all meant to be that it was crazy internet yesterday because of the weather. <clears throat> How are you today? I'm feeling better than I ought to. Oh, well, that that's a good answer. Better than you ought to. <laughs> um. Well, I appreciate you being on the show today. I appreciate your having me and hope that this is the beginning of a long relationship. Yeah, I'm really um, excited to get to learn more about you. I'm sure Bill shared with you some of my like questions back as we kind of booked the show where I was most interested was what you did before you even got into cannabis. And so before we kind of hop into that, I would love to hear a little bit about district cannabis. And I think one of the coolest stories is how you came to find cannabis. And then maybe we can go back in history. I came the hard way yeah. through Parkinson's disease, which is a neurodegenerative condition that affects the way all of the motors of the body work. I confess I don't know if I should confess to something can I trust you to edit it <laughs> you out? can confess to me <laughs> I had experimented with marijuana as any child of the 60s would which meant not always being direct with the security clearance forms Mm -hmm. that from time to time had to be done. But my experimenting with marijuana was relatively infrequent. Always a pleasure. And when I found after I was diagnosed with Parkinson's that the Israelis were using marijuana as one of the therapies, I became very interested again yeah. in marijuana in cannabis because every time we use the word marijuana we add to the stigma that was cynically imposed on the minority communities And they had to have a catchy name for it. Yeah. And marijuana and killer weed sounded better than mother's own. Yeah. But <clears throat> I found out about the Israeli work. I talked to several neurologists. And finally met a horticulturalist who has become my partner about using 
marijuana as a therapy. And they all replied, whatever their discipline, this is a therapy on a very individual individualistic basis. Yeah. My symptoms for Parkinson's are different than your symptoms. It is a very idiosyncratic condition. I don't think people really knew that. I think people, at least I only thought Parkinson's was only a few things, but it can vary from person to person. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Michael J. Fox has a line. If you've met a person with Parkinson's, you know one person with Parkinson's. Yeah. But. That makes sense. It also means that you have to experiment to find the time. Well, it means a number of things. First, my neurologist made it very clear to me, whatever I smoked before was different from what was being offered now. Yeah. And I had to find a source that so rigidly controlled growing conditions that the effect would be the same from dose to dose to dose. Mm -hmm. It also had to be free of pesticides, fungicides, and all of the other heavy chemicals that were suitable for deforesting Vietnam, but not mm. for human consumption. In any event, he summed up the advice Ask what you're getting, and if it's Acapulco Gold Run. <laughs> That's funny. That is a favorite strain of mine, though. <laughs> if you can find the real strain. That is very true. You do have to find the real stuff. Because everybody calls oregano mm -hmm. or other adulterants. Well, oregano wasn't too bad. <laughs> but in any event, I set on a search to find a reliable source of cannabis and from a grower who was scientific so that we could crossbreed in a search for the right therapy. We got, I guess, we went for a period of years where I smuggled my medicine back to Washington. Mm -hmm. And then one day, Andras Kirshner, who was my partner and who was growing up legally in California, had, but was originally from Washington, and he had a family condition that made it possible for him to come back we decided to open a business in the district 
then we competed for one in Maryland, which if you'll recall, and I do believe they've tightened up things at the Radical Marijuana Board, but things were not tight. Our premise when we went in, the promise the state of Maryland made was that these would be graded anonymous applications would be graded anonymously and ranked based on their grade and the top 15 would win their licenses in Maryland. We found out that we were number six in Maryland, but somehow in the rating process became number 16 hmm. so that they could put someone's cousin in the business. Maryland, hmm. are you a native Marylander? I mean, since kindergarten, so I consider myself a native. Well, one of the things you have is a well-deserved reputation for not always turning straight corners. Oh, Maryland? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I feel like people could say that about most states. <laughs> Unfortunately, that's true. Yeah. And fortunately, we sued the state of Maryland and we won a license. And we are, to the best of my knowledge, the only ones in Maryland who are committed to keeping the highest botanical standards for our crops. I would imagine since I feel like from your story, you created this to help you, right? And so, and others, but that's why you would need it to be tested and if you are looking for you know the same dosage that's one of the biggest problems with teaching someone about cannabis is there is a lot of nuance to this and you really you know my favorite strain i love sativas or g is g6 it works really well for me but there'll be months where there's no g6 and so that's really tough for me, because that really works for me and, you know, the growing cycle of it all. When you were setting up this to be like really medical, what were some of the things you took into consideration to kind of help with those? As you mentioned, like you needed the same dose and the same uh, medicine in there every time. First of all, we had to find some way of acquiring the cannabinoids mm. in the system other than smoking. Yep. So we, I believe, are the only people with a full line, capsules, yeah. oils, salves, I'm ch chocolates, lozenges, and the control of the dosage is more in the edible than in the flower. 
Yeah. We also, and I don't know if you've had a chance to try any of our products. I've had your flower out of D.C. When I've gone and visited D.C., I've picked up some down there. Well, Andras believes in the flower. Yeah, I'm a big flower person. It all starts with the flower. And even though in order to ensure dosage, we may put it in a stable form so that you're controlling the dosage you get of tinctures And uh, it's not so bad, by the way, to have to experiment. (laughs) I mean, I think when I mentioned to anybody I'm lightly in the cannabis industry, that's the first thing they ask me is, do I get to sample everything? I go, no, not in Maryland. That's not how this works. (laughs) But maybe one day in rec. But I, that is such a good byproduct that you get to test and see the Actually, things that you're making. I get screwed because we have outside investors. Uh-huh. We, and everybody would want us we can only sell to a dis- sell or give to a dispensary, yeah. and then they sell it back yeah. to us. Yeah, yeah. The that was probably one of the most interesting things that I learned was like it's not like if you have a grow, you have access to just go pick the pretty plants whenever you want. Nope, you have to go purchase it just like everybody else. What were you doing before the cannabis business? Oh, well, that's, um, so I started my career in multifamily housing. So think like apartment buildings. I worked um, for the Bazuto group. I was their corporate trainer. So a lot of adult education in my life. And um, I started how I kind of got into entrepreneurship is I realized in multifamily housing, I was really good at what I did. So I started a consulting business and worked with large apartment communities that were distressed, that needed sales help, that were about to be taken over by the bank because they weren't reaching occupancy. So that's what I did before Canvas. And still kind of like I have a real day job. I'm an editor and a chief of a magazine. Um, But I still like I love the cannabis community so much, which is why I continue to do this because I like to get this information out there so that people like you um, get access to medicine that they need and to shed on a light on such a, an amazing industry and plant. I think the media and government has done an amazing job of stigmatizing this And so you have people who could live if they just were able to get past the stigma of cannabis. And so that's why I kind of do what I do with the podcast. It was such a cynical move to declare a war on drugs. And I was politically involved at the time and counseled the president of Reagan. But... The more I learned about the private prison industry, the evangelical opposition, I became very clear to me that this was not a dangerous drug to anybody but the poor 
kid who got picked up on the street and found himself in a incarcerated yeah. and taken care of by the lowest bidder. Yeah. How, so given that, so that is like a perfect segue into really like um, when I booked that we were going to have you on the show, you know, there's a lot of like cannabis Facebook groups um, out there and there's a couple of Maryland based ones. And I put it up to the community. I said, I'm going to be interviewing the owner of District Cannabis. Like, what would you like to know? And most of the questions came back about what your role may or may not have been in the war on drugs. And then how today you're making good with that. Because I, I feel like, you know, I wikipedia you to death and did, you know, all the research I could, although I have a very limited understanding of like exactly what your job was and how government really works. Um, I would imagine that you probably saw some of the, the worst outcomes of what Ronald Reagan did and all the presidents after. Nobody's off the hook, well, for this yet, by the way. Exclusively on Reagan. I think at the least LBJ when the war started creating disturbances on the street. Yeah. Started using drug charges as a way of removing the riffraff. Oh, yeah. I mean, it started way before Reagan. I mean, the first anti-opium laws back in the late 1800s was for Chinese immigrants. I mean, it's, they've always used someone's drug of choice to incarcerate them. They've used it both to anesthetize them and incarcerate them. And it is not a coincidence that the Chinese were under threat for opium use. The Latin Americans were under threat for marijuana use. And to add insult to injury, People like us, people who are white, were given a slap on the wrist. Yeah. For the most part, there are still prisoners, and that's why, to circle around to your question of our feeling that we have to put something back as well as take. We've been supporting the last prisoner project. Nice. But so much damage was done. It's going to take a lot of giving back. And it's going to take a lot of correcting of misimpressions. Yeah. What do you think a, a like fair and equitable future in the cannabis industry looks like? Well, the first thing is you are dealing with a medicine. It may be dispensed over the counter and should be dispensed over the counter, 
but it is a psychoactive drug and I believe there has to be a protection of the public from adulterants. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we can talk all we like about fairness, but it's got to be healthy and fair. And unfortunately, those with the knowledge and the capital at the moment are white for the most part. Yeah, I mean, I think maybe the statement, the capital is correct. I don't think knowledge rests only in white people. In fact, I may argue that the black community knows more about cannabis than, and really with the legacy market, we're the ones that paved the way for you to be able to do this too. There is no question Afro-Americans paved the way for me and for everybody else in the business. But when I overstate knowledge. I don't mean that there, I mean there are fewer Blacks that have gone to the trouble of getting degrees in agriculture, soil science. This is a very Growing weed is easy. You throw some seeds. And in fact, I used to get pretty good results. Not consistent results. But the science there is no substitute for experience or training. And we have to do a much better job than we're doing. I talk to people, but have, because of my own problems, not followed through getting cannabis taught in agriculture programs of historically but historically black colleges mm -hmm. because the first step in reaching for fairness or equality is not to let anybody be subject to somebody who uses DT, DDT to save a crop but likely do great harm to a lung. Mm -hmm. I think one thing, well, first, so that's the flower. There have to be rules, I believe, that affect to protect the public safety sure. with a flower. Mm -hmm. There are a number of areas of the business, though, that don't require great capital or scientific experience. 
delivery. Testing if they had the background for it to run a testing program. And internships but the way we're, we're going to have to address I mean this is you'd really be interesting to have a drink with and put feet <laughs> up on the table This I'm sorry, every You're once fine. in a while I I do the same thing, so don't even worry about it. <laughs> what were we? We were talking about what a fair and equitable future looked like. And you were oh talked about like the flower. And We've got, if we're really talking fair and equitable, and although I was Reagan's lawyer, I also crossed the bridge with Carl Lewis mm -hmm. in 1964. We've got to do more than address this narrow segment of the economy called cannabis. We've got to have everything from regular food for children that are not getting proper nourishment We've got to remove the bias that I think, if we're honest, all of us yeah. have to fight to suppress. One role for cannabis that just occurred to me, so it's probably a dumb idea, but if people smoke cannabis, people who smoke cannabis have a sense of in the moment and a sense of the universality of human humankind. Yeah. And that's a commercial for district cannabis, actually. <laughs> True. <laughs> I agree with you. I think um, people who consume cannabis and then consume cannabis with other people, there's something, there is a whole culture of cannabis. There's a, 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 a family, a community one joint lasts just as long with one person or five people and you feel the same effects no matter what. And, you know, when you talk to a lot of individuals with PTSD, it's the consuming of cannabis in a group that actually heals them. And so I think, you know, for me and maybe some other people in the cannabis community, that culture, that feeling the power we get from that this very special plant is worth protecting. And I think that's why when um, 
people talk about the industry only being reserved for those with millions of dollars in degrees, I just think that's false. They're not ever the ones that have created that. And I'm not saying there's not a place for them. I'm just saying the community's not that. You're coming into a community, not you per se, but these individuals that have lots of money and are buying up these licenses are coming into a community they have no knowledge about and are making medicine that they have no connection with. And that's why when, you know, businesses get upset that community members get upset, well, it's because we're protecting something that's so special. I mean, think about you and, and how long it took you, you were smuggling in cannabis to help you with your Parkinson's and you were able to do that. There are people who need this so much and don't have access to it because governments held it up because, you know, MMCCs and legislation and greedy millionaires are keeping it out of the hands of people. And it's real tough to like see that because it is something so special to be able to puff, puff, pass. Maybe not during COVID, but you know. <laughs> That's the thing that COVID has caused me to miss the most. Yeah. Because there is a special bond that comes when you're sharing but I think you were, no buts, I think you were right. Although capital alone isn't going to save some of these people who were awarded license polit licenses politically. Yeah. In order to make an operation successful, you need someone like Andras. And Andras is my full partner and close friend, though many years separate us. He's got degrees in soil science, in cytology, in business. Wow. Went out to California because it was the only legal place he could grow cannabis at that time. If you were a medical cooperative, you were allowed to grow. He worked and really developed his approach, which involves putting sensors in the roots of the plant so they can tell not just how much fertilizer to give it, but over how long a period of time. Yeah. It is really cool that like how far the technology has come to be able to grow these, this weed that, you know, you use special lights and water and you get to create some magic with it. I've heard Andreas speak on a podcast, I'm pretty sure, with you before. What I really love is the energy that comes from being around growing things. Yeah. And there is nothing quite so satisfying to me as to watch something go from a seed 
to an instrument of pleasure and therapy. Yeah. It is pretty spectacular. In fact, one of my friend's jokes, Voltaire, the French Enlightenment philosopher, said when worldly philosophy fails you, it's time to cultivate your own garden. And I had reached a point where it was really time to cultivate a garden to put some energy into the earth rather than just keep taking it out. Yeah. I I think, you know, from a, a standpoint from like being a community member, you know, I think we all know people can have change of hearts about what they think about something. In fact, that's what makes being human so great as our thoughts aren't static and we can grow and we can learn. In fact, I always wasn't so pro-cannabis either. I grew up very religious and didn't understand like the power of it. And I think you're a good example of like a change of heart and you kind of understanding like the I have to tell you, and I probably shouldn't be so blunt, but one of the qualities that I love about cannabis is I say what I think. I don't think about what I'm going to say for very long. Yep. But... I didn't start out a proponent of the war on on drugs. I didn't know how evil it was. Nobody did. But I went along with it because Mrs. Reagan went along with it. Yeah. And anything that had the interests of Mrs. Reagan was a litmus test for loyalty in in that White House. In fact, the special office, it was called the special office for drug abuse or was down the hall mostly full of Second Amendment fanatics who I didn't have a lot to do with anyway. Yeah. I think that that's what makes being a human special is that we can recognize those things. I agree, I didn't realize how bad it was. I had my fair share of stigma, things I've said to people my entire life. And, you know, once I know, you just do better, right? Now that you know, we just do better. And we be better for the community. That's what's good for the community makes it a better community. And my father's favorite books were by a man named Norman Vincent Peale. Mm -hmm. And while I question some of it, I don't question that we can create our own realities. And in that choice, we've come to the perfect point to close. 
Yep, I think so. Ed, it's been such a pleasure talking to you today, learning more about district cannabis. Is there anything last you want to say before we sign off? Take good care of your bud tender. Yeah. And they'll take good care of you. Correct. If they sell district cannabis, <laughs> they don't have district cannabis, something's wrong. Well, we'll send them your way if they don't. How's that? And your next trip to Washington, I hope you'll call and yes. we'll have you over to see what we've got going. Absolutely. I'll let you know when I'm heading down that way. I'll look forward. Thanks so much, Ed. Have a great day. Thank you. Do you do people call you Jillian or Mary Jane? So it's funny. I get Jill most of the time, but every now and again, um, if like I'm at an event, someone will be like, "Oh, are you Mary Jane?" Which is I love it. Like I think it's a fun little persona to have. But most of the time, just Jill. Well, Jill, it's been a pleasure. It's a pleasure. I'll see you later. Thanks. Bye-bye.